Good afternoon. To do the thank yous, first of all, thank you obviously to Wilma and David for organising this fabulous event. Thank you to Nick and Nick for providing breakfast and the best bit of the lunch as well. And thank you to all of you for coming along on this beautiful day to learn more about ethical farming. So without further ado, if you've seen me present before, I do like to have a lot of references because this is a evidence-based presentation and the references uh, will be on this forward slash, so on my website, forward slash EFC19. And you just need to make a note of the slide number in the bottom right-hand corner and then you'll be able to see what uh, the references are for that particular slide. So we're going to start off with some facts about food. And people think they know what food actually is, um, but I've yet to meet doctors, nurses, and even indeed many dietitians who know what food actually is. What are we advised to eat? Why are we advised to eat in this way? Then we're going to get into the heart of the presentation, which is the evidence, particularly looking at red meat and dietary fat. What do I think we should be eating? What do I think is really going on in this whole arena of food and evidence-based dietary guidelines? And what could possibly be our way forward as people interested in food and ethical farming? So we're going to start off with what is food? And food is actually, real food anyway, is actually mostly water, which not many people realize. We then have three things that we call macronutrients, big nutrients, things that we arguably need in large quantities. We know them as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Those are our macronutrients. Now, there are, it may interest you to know, there are essential proteins, we call those amino acids. There are essential fatty acids, and they may be known as omega-3 and omega-6, or N3, N6, to different uh, people in the audience. And then there is carbohydrate. But there is no essential carbohydrate. We actually do not need to eat carbohydrate from the day that we're born until the day that we die. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't eat carbohydrate. It happens to be one of my favorite things to eat. But just to set the nutritional facts out, this is a fabulous quotation from the 2005 panel on macronutrients. The dietary requirement for, zero, for carbohydrate is zero, provided that we eat enough essential fats and complete protein. And then we have micronutrients, small nutrients. We know those as vitamins and minerals. These are things that we need in smaller quantities than the macronutrients, although as you've just seen, we don't need carbohydrate at all. And we've got 13 vitamins, we've got the four fat-soluble vitamins, we've got eight water-soluble B vitamins and then vitamin C. And there's more debate on the number of minerals that we need, but you'll know those as calcium, magnesium, iron, sodium, potassium, copper, zinc, and so on. So that is essentially what food is. Um, and I did sit in one of the sessions this morning at the back, so I do appreciate it's quite difficult for people at the back to see this. So I might actually now wander down and do what they say is the weather girl bit, um, because this is one of my favorite charts that I've put together on what food actually is. So remember those three macronutrients. On the left-hand side of this chart, you've got pure carbohydrate. There is only one pure carbohydrate on the planet, and that is sucrose. And arguably, that should not even be called a food because it has no nutritional value whatsoever. But it is 100% carbohydrate. This end of the spectrum, we have 100% fat. And that can be your oils, whether it's coconut oil, olive oil, or it could be lard. Butter is not a 100% fat because it does have some water and it does have some protein. Now, this really fascinates me, and the laser doesn't work. Um, but protein is then in absolutely everything other than those two extremes. So there's protein in lettuce, there's protein in apples, protein in bread. So it's actually quite difficult to be deficient in protein. You have to have a pretty lousy diet to manage to achieve that. And then I find it fascinating that when nature provides real food, nature tends to provide 
carbohydrate proteins, which if you remember your primary colours now become green because that's your yellow and blue, and it tends to provide fat proteins. Now the way to remember these is that the carbohydrate proteins are things that vegans would eat. They come from the trees and the ground, that's your grains, your legumes, your vegetables and your fruits. Now most of those foods do also contain a trace of fat, which I also find very interesting that nature is put in fat in virtually everything, but pretty much only in trace amounts. Now over here we've got the fat proteins, which is the things that vegans don't eat. These are the dairy, eggs, meat and fish. They're the things that come from animals or things that come from faces. Now, fascinatingly, nature puts carbohydrate, fat and protein all together only in rare circumstances. And those rare circumstances are nuts, seeds, and avocados, which we can argue whether that's a fruit or not. I think it's a nut. It's in that category anyway. Now, that doesn't often happen in nature. Nature tends to separate out the carbs and the fats with protein being in everything. That carb-fat combo is the domain of the fake food world. They have realized that we find that Moorish, we can't stop eating them once we start, and utterly irresistible. Once we see that it's there, we want it. That's the domain of the cakes, the cookies, the muffins, the ice cream, the confectionery, chocolate, and so on. So they have worked out that this thing, which is nutritionally very dense in nature, is actually something that we will eat too much of. And that is the entire focus of the fake food industry, which is why when I try to help people to lose weight, I say you should be having carb protein meals or fat protein meals, but steer clear of the mixing of the fats and the carbohydrates because you'll find it irresistible. You've got a limit on bread. Start adding butter to bread, you'll have no limit. You get the gist already. Right, and you can see there that if you then superimpose the fact that we need complete protein and we need essential fats, you start seeing that we get being drawn to this hand, the right-hand side of the chart here. So what is fat? Well, without getting into the chemistry, because I don't want to upset people after lunch, there are three fats, and you will have heard of saturated fat, because saturated fat is, of course, the devil incarnate. We will see in a moment that that is not the case. We have monounsaturated fat and we have polyunsaturated fat. Now, I think they should be called stable fats, monounstable fats, and polyunstable fats, because saturated fat is the most stable of those fats. For those of you who can see at the back, you've got all the hydrogen atoms partnered with the carbon atom, which is where they should be. When you get into a monounsaturated fat, you've got one double bond, which means you've got a couple of the hydrogen atoms missing. When you get into a polyunsaturated fat, you've got at least two double bonds, and you've got a couple of the hydrogen atoms missing. Now, that's why this one is liquid at fridge temperature. This one is liquid at room temperature, and this one is pretty solid wherever you put it. So it's the most stable fat, makes it the safest fat to cook with. So the safest fats to cook with are butter, uh, which is not entirely saturated, but predominantly, and lard, and probably coconut oil above things like the highly polyunsaturated fats of sunflower oil, which of course the whole world has been told to cook with. So we pretty much got it all upside down wrong. Two facts about fat, which really are not widely enough known, is first of all that every single food that contains fat contains all three fats. There are no exceptions. So for this talk, I was originally given the title of looking at red meat and animal fats. And of course, I went straight back and said, there's no such thing as an animal fat. There are three fats. They are found in animal foods and they are found in plant foods, and those are not different. And the second really interesting factoid about fat is that the only food group that has more saturated than unsaturated fat is dairy as a food group. Now, that's not to say that saturated is bad and unsaturated is good, but just to give you a nutritional fact. Now, with those two nutritional facts, you will be able to spot on this chart which foods, if there are foods, or which one food, single or many, has more saturated than unsaturated fat. You've got some steak, eggs, mackerel, lard, almonds, olive oil, and low-fat milk. Anyone paying attention to the previous slide? 
The only one that has more saturated than unsaturated fat is actually the low-fat milk. Again, not that saturated fat is bad. But you can then start having some fun because what this slide shows, and my husband in the very uh, racy pink top there at the front has some of these postcards, if I can find this. I love this postcard. Um, and it's really handy to just whip out of the handbag or the wallet when people start attacking saturated fat because you have some fun. Because the two numbers we've got next to each of these foods are the total fat for that food is the first number. And the second number is the saturated fat for that food. Now, it's per 100 grams. So that also gives you it as a percentage immediately. And that's when you can see you can start having some fun because we are told, are we not, let's eat oily fish, but let's avoid red meat. Well, as you can see, oily fish has got twice the total fat and one and a half times the saturated fat of red meat. Not that either of those is a bad food. To me, they're both great foods, but just to set the record straight. Lard is full of saturated fat, apparently. Well, the main fat in lard is mono unsaturated fat, the same as in olive oil. So let's look at olive oil now. Look how much more fat and saturated fat, seven times the, fat, the saturated fat in olive oil as steak. But of course, you wouldn't eat 100 grams of olive oil. No, but a tablespoon of olive oil has more saturated fat than a 100 gram pork chop. So you can start making a mockery of our dietary guidelines when you know a little bit about nutrition and food. And those are the ones that we've just had a little chuckle on. Now, we say some really daft things when it comes to red meat. And the two daftest things that we say, first of all, is that it will clog your arteries. And there is only one way in which red meat can clog your arteries, and that's if you intravenously inject it, which I don't recommend, but it probably then could clog your arteries. There is no other way in which it can leap out of your digestive system and into your arterial system to somehow clog your frigging arteries, for goodness sake. The second thing that they say is that it's full of saturated fat. Well, let's see what it is full of. And it's the same as the steak that was on the previous slide. So you're going to recognize some of these numbers. What was the first slide? Real food is mostly water. So we have 70 plus percent water for our steak. We then have 21 percent protein. We then have ash and minerals. We've then got the total amount of fat, 7%, 7 grams per 100 gram. And just a couple of that is the saturated fat. So apart from the minerals and the ash, saturated fat quite literally is the last thing that that steak particularly is. Now, the references are on that slide. You can play on that database to your heart's content. Yes, you'll be able to find a fatty lamb that has got a higher content of fat, less protein. It will have a similar amount of water, but you will still find more unsaturated than saturated fat because it's not a dairy product. So that's what meat is all full of. So what do we advise to eat? Now, you might think that a balanced diet would balance those three macronutrients. So we might have a third protein, a third fat, and a third carbohydrate. Food doesn't work in that way. A really interesting factoid about food is that in any natural diet, a couple of great references on this slide 14, any natural diet tends to be approximately 15% protein. And that's been proven with the Pure study, and it's been proven with a theoretical reference as well. You can try to bump your protein up, which is what the bodybuilders do, and they do some really stupid things to do that. They have the protein shakes, they have skinless chicken breasts, they have white fish, they do some really daft things and screw up their kidneys and whatever for the future. That is not natural. It's going to be about 15%, maybe 20% if you're more on the animal side of that chart that we saw earlier. So then you might think, well, fat and carbohydrate might be a little bit balanced. Well, no, they're not, because in 1983 in the UK and in 1977 in the US, we declared that fat was bad. Fat was a killer. Fat was going to do very bad things for us. And so we therefore set an upper limit on total fat of no more than 30% of our diet's calories. And you can see what that immediately means. You have immediately set a carbohydrate minimum of 55% because it's just got to take up the slack. 
That's the general what we're advising people to eat. When they put that general amount into what they considered a pictorial representation, they started off with a plate called the balance of good health. Then it became something that they called the eat well plate. I call it the eat badly plate. And this is now the eat badly guide, which came out in March 2016. They want that to be visual. So they're hoping that about a third of the plate will be starchy carbohydrates, about a third will be fruit and vegetables. Well, look what happens when you take the average calorie value for 100 grams of each of those foods and see what it then means for what your intake is going to be. So I've calculated this. I did it in my 2010 obesity book. I updated it when they brought out this new guide. 62% of your plate become starchy carbohydrates, things that your granny would have given up if she wanted to get into her prom dress. And then on this side of the plate, where you're supposed to be having a third, it comes down to 8%, because of course fruit and veg are very low in calories. Then we've got in this section here, which is our, you'll notice it says dairy and alternatives, because they would be really happy if you weren't eating dairy, but you were having soy, and rice milk and almond milk and whatever else going on in there, that only ends up being 6%. We've got 11% and again, they don't even put meat first. They start off with beans and pulses and other sources of protein, which is ridiculous because as you all now know, everything on that plate other than the pure fats and oils has protein. So that's, to me, the healthiest category. That's where you've got the meat, fish, the eggs and the dairy products and that ends up being pretty tiny. The junk, because they won't take junk off the plate, and we'll see why in just a minute. So the junk ends up being bigger than the dairy, notwithstanding that it's not entirely dairy and almost as big as the meat. And then you've got these uh, unsaturated fats they want you to eat over on the right-hand side here. And when they launched this plate, they launched five menus at the same time, and they came down almost as quickly as they came up because they probably didn't want someone like me analyzing them, but it was too late I'd grabbed them. Um, so I analyzed them, and, and you'll be able to see them. If any of you want them, shout me afterwards, uh, get my email, I'll send them through, because they want you to have carbs for breakfast and then something like a currant bun. They love tea cakes and currant buns. Uh, then they want you to have a starchy lunch, then they want you to have a snack, and then a starchy dinner, and then to snack. And then Public Health England wonders why most people have got diabetes and obesity. And they haven't quite worked out that we just don't give our body the chance to stop digesting carbohydrate. So I analyzed those menus and forget the 15, 30, and 55, they are up as high as 65 to 70% carbohydrate. The one macronutrient we don't even need is what we are being almost entirely told to base our meals on. And then not surprisingly, they were nutritionally deficient, particularly in the fat-soluble vitamins. And we need to remember that fat-soluble vitamins come from, in, in almost all cases, from two sources. And the body in every circumstance wants the animal form. So the body wants retinol, it doesn't want carotene. The body wants D3 far more than D2. It wants K2, you can get K2 from fermented foods, but it's also very easy to get them from animal foods. And it ends up being deficient in calcium and a whole host of other things as well. So why did we do this? Well, we have to explain why we did this, because it was such a crazy thing to do. As I said, 1977, America went first. They then came out with their dietary guidelines for Americans. They get updated every five years. So 1980 were the first. The most recent ones that we've just had are the 2015 dietary guidelines, and they're working on the 2020 guidelines at the moment. There is no sign from having looked at the committee that has been chosen that they're going to move away from the very high carbohydrate, low fat diet that they've been advising for all of this time, nearly 40 years. We followed, we weren't the only ones, almost the whole world, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, most of Europe, all went the same way. Um, and then a, a seminal paper in the UK, the Diet and Cardiovascular Disease Policy, came out in 1984. And essentially we did a U-turn in our dietary advice when we introduced those dietary guidelines. So we used to believe, and I always credit Gary Taubes with this quotation, um, I would never have found it, great find, from Tanner's 1869 Practice of Medicine, farinaceous, flowery, and vegetable, interesting, 
foods are fattening and saccharine, sugary matters are especially so. That's what we used to believe. And we've carried on believing that for well over 100 years until we did the U-turn that said, basically, base your meals on starchy foods. The things that we used to know made us fat, we now think we should base our meals on. And the reason given was all about that fat guideline, the 30% total fat, 10% saturated fat. And all of that was done in the name of heart disease, because we thought that fat was responsible for heart disease. I'll present the evidence on that any second. And this is really important to note. We don't tell people to have a mass of carbohydrate in their diet because we know that it's healthy. We don't even know that it's safe. And may I suggest the experiment that we've done with the human race over the last 40 years, we've proved quite conclusively that it is not safe to consume that amount of carbohydrate. It's entirely because we've got 15% protein, you then set the 30% fat limit, carbohydrate takes up the rest. It's not because we know carbohydrate to be safe. Now, Christine did me a favor this morning because Christine introduced the concept of meta-analysis. Before I move into the evidence-based section, just want to explain what the best evidence is. This is a classic pyramid of evidence, so we're not going to go down here. When you look at animal studies, just ignore all of those case reports, case series. Let's go right up to the top of the pyramid. And there's only really three types of evidence that we should be looking at in nutrition. So we start off with uh, cohort studies, what we call epidemiology. And a cohort study would be to take, let's say, the population in Castle Douglas and to have started looking at them 20 years ago and to get as many people as would sign up to our trial and to say, we want to know what you eat, do you exercise, do you smoke, do you take any drugs, how much TV do you watch, capture as much as we can about the time as possible and then follow that town over the next 20, 30 years to see who goes on to get illness. And that's how we observe things like people who smoke go on to develop lung cancer. Um, and that's, that's the epidemiology, that's the cohort studies. There's something even better than a cohort study, much better, and it's called a randomized controlled trial. Now, if when you were walking into this room, we'd given you each an L or an R, and said, if you've got an L, sit on the left-hand side of the hall, and if you've got an R, sit on the right-hand side of the hall, completely random. And then we said to you lot, right, over the next six to eight weeks for your evening meal, you must have 200 grams of red meat. And for your evening meal, you must have, make it isocaloric, you must have, let's say, 100 grams of pasta. And then at the end of the eight weeks, we'd have decided what measure we wanted to take to see what happened. So the cohort studies, we can only observe associations. People who happen to drink more tend to get liver damage. It's just an association. We should then go in and do a randomized controlled trial to see if we can get from association to causation. The intervention trials can indicate causation, so they're the powerful ones. And then as Christine said this morning, the really powerful modern technique of meta-analysis pulls together either intervention trials or the population studies, and it's obviously then more powerful because you're not just looking at one study, you put in, for example, 10 together. What can also happen is if you've got 10 pretty poor studies and you put 10 pretty poor studies together, rubbish in, rubbish out. So you do have to take care, but that's your pyramid of evidence. So my PhD, which I did up in this neck of the woods, um, working with a professor also down in Cardiff University, was asking the question, when those dietary fat guidelines were introduced, 30% total fat, 10% saturated fat, was the evidence there at the time? If we went back to 1977 in the US, 1983 in the UK, used the modern technique of meta-analysis and pulled all the evidence available, would it tell us we should have introduced those two guidelines? And then I brought it up to date and said, okay, we're not in 83 anymore. At the time I was looking at this, we were in 2015. What does the evidence say today? So the first paper that came out was looking at the evidence available, randomized controlled trial evidence, the best evidence available at the time the guidelines were introduced. 
that paper was the 64th most impactful paper in any discipline in 2015. That's the level of interest that people have in nutrition and in whether or not it's evidence-based. And it was all over the papers. Essentially, the dietary fat guidelines should not have been introduced. The evidence was not there at the time. The evidence to dam butter or any other dietary fat just wasn't there. The cohort evidence at the time also concluded exactly the same thing. There was no evidence whatsoever from population studies for introducing those guidelines at the time. You bring it up to date, there is no more evidence available today to damn those two dietary fat issues, and there is no more epidemiological evidence available today. All the references for this are on slide 21. And then there was a summary paper that pulled together all four aspects of the PhD to say the dietary guidelines essentially have no evidence base, so where do we go from here? Now, you don't have to take my word for it, not least because when I started studying this, I was vegetarian. So if anything, I was going in with a confirmation bias that I would find against fat, but I didn't find against fat. And I was one of six groups of researchers who have looked at exactly what I have done, not going back to the time that the guidelines were introduced, that was the novel bit, but they've looked at what I have done, going back to 2009, right up to 2016, six different teams of researchers, and they've looked at mortality, which is the most important thing, all-cause mortality, and mortality of some kind from heart disease whether it's coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease, but they've looked at mortality because that's what counts. And they would look at different things. They would look at just the pure level of total fat or the pure level of saturated fat or studies that would swap out saturated fat and swap in polyunsaturated fat. This is the most important column in the whole of evidence base for dietary fat because across those six teams of researchers, you can see that there were 37 non-findings. And I only put in two of ours, so a couple of ours. The, the non-finding was the most significant thing. The lack of evidence against dietary fat is the most single overwhelming thing. But that never gets reported. We only ever hear when there is a finding. So let's look at the three findings. There was one from the Chowdhury team in 2014, which was looking at trans fats. Trans fats found to be very bad for heart disease. You'll get no fight from anyone in this room, I would imagine, on that. This is not natural trans fats in ruminants. This is industrially produced trans fatty acids. Bad news in fake food. Won't disagree. And then you've got the Hooper study here and the Hooper study in 2011. The only ones that have found anything and they found something between <coughs> cardiovascular disease events and swapping out saturated fat and swapping in polyunsaturated fat. So they tried to claim you should swap out your saturated fat, swap in your polyunsaturated fat. It's exactly the same finding that they found two times. In their own 155-page report, when you look at the sensitivity test, where they looked at not only the studies that intended to make that swap, but the studies that did actually achieve that swap, the significance falls away. And those two then also become non-findings. And you are left with one issue with trans fats and non-findings for, and it's important to stress this, all-cause mortality, CVD mortality, coronary heart disease mortality, myocardial infarctions, whether fatal, that's heart attacks, fatal or non-fatal, or strokes, all coronary heart disease events, no findings whatsoever. And you will still have people saying to you that dietary fat causes heart disease or will cause you to die earlier. That is the entirety of the evidence that is available in the world, and that is what it says. So if anyone is telling you anything to the contrary, they are cherry-picking something, not the totality of the evidence. So we're now moving away from dietary fat to red meat. And because you now know the evidence pyramid, we're going to start at the top of the evidence pyramid. And we're going to look at all the meta-analysis evidence against red meat. And I didn't forget to put anything on that slide. That is all the meta-analysis <laughs> evidence against red meat. And we will therefore move down. You're going to pick this up now. What's going to happen with this slide? Oh, I didn't forget anything on this slide either. Because this is all the RCT evidence against red meat. The studies have not even been done. And arguably, the studies never can be done. 
because it would be impossible just to change red meat in somebody's diet because the minute that experiment we, we, just, we talked about earlier, you're on the red meat, you're on the pasta, the minute you've done that, you've changed all three macronutrients, carbs, fat, and protein. You probably well, you have. You've changed all 13 vitamins. You've changed all the minerals. You've changed all the individual fats. You've changed the individual fat chain lengths. You've changed everything. How can you say it was the red meat? So that's all the RCT evidence. So then you have to look at the population study evidence. Slide 25 will take you to an open blog where I document the evidence against red meat. And it was, um, this got me invited to one conference and then the next slide got me invited to the next conference. For this one, I went back to the Nutrition Evidence Library in the US and they used this Nutrition Evidence Library to inform the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines for Americans. So I thought, right, I'll go to their evidence. I'm, I'm not going to uh, I'll start as if they've done it very honestly, if they've cherry-picked, I'm not even going to question that. I'm just going to take their evidence from their own library. first interesting thing was they didn't have a section on red meat. They had a section on animal protein. So I said, okay, I'll start off at animal protein, and then I'll um, see where I go from there. And they wanted to look at animal protein, and they wanted to look at seven particular health conditions. So you've got things there from cardiovascular disease, mostly for people at the back here, blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, body weight, colorectal cancer, that's bowel cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. So three cancers, and then the other things that we would think of as non-communicable diseases. And I would start looking at that. So for example, with cardiovascular disease, there were only seven studies. Four of them were entirely on eggs, so nothing to do with red meat. One was a low-carb study. You look at the other two, and they didn't actually evaluate red meat. They were about something else. So I can ignore all of that. There, there's no red meat evidence in the American Library. Then you go to blood pressure. At the animal protein level, they found no association between anything and blood pressure. So I don't need to look any further. I don't need to chisel down into red meat. And you consistently find there's no association, or they didn't evaluate red meat, or there's no association, or they didn't examine red meat. So there's no cohort evidence against red meat either. But then the IARC, the International Association for Research into Cancer, April 2018, this is the um, blog that I did that got me then an invite to the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association conference in Stevenage uh, last year because I looked at the IIRC report. And again, I thought, I'm not going to challenge your evidence. I'm just going to go to your report, 511 pages long. I have such a fun life. Um, went through that, and uh, they basically had come out from that um, and said there are 14 studies, 14 cohort studies that we're going to rely upon for saying that meat, red meat, remember this one, red meat is probably carcinogenic. How irresponsible is that from a government agency? And processed meat is carcinogenic, essentially particularly for colorectal cancer. Well, of their 14 studies, 13 out of the 14 had no association whatsoever, let alone causation. And there was one study that said, whichever definition of red meat was used, whether it's red meat or processed meat, there was one study, which was the Seventh-day Adventist study, that said we found an association. Interestingly, it was an association between meat and fish and colorectal cancer, chicken, not just red meat. So it wasn't damning red meat either. And even the IARC ca cautioned that that's not the most reliable study. Well, 13 of your 14 studies found no association whatsoever. Go to that blog on page 27, because it just goes through each of the 14 studies, and it will dictate verbatim their own conclusion. How is this allowed to happen, that we have national headlines saying <coughs> red meat is probably carcinogenic when their own evidence is not saying anything to do with carcinogens? And we need to make the point that there are associations found with processed meat and various conditions, never with red meat. You will never find a true definition of red meat and any evidence against red meat, let alone the red meat that is coming out from the farms of the people in this room. Forget that they haven't studied red meat. They certainly haven't studied pasture-fed red meat or ethically farmed red meat. Um, and there is also a world of difference between a delicatessen meat and what we would call processed meat. So they should not also put processed meat all in the same category, because naturally preserving meat with salting and curing is the way that we've preserved meat 
for generations. That is so different to the spam that you'll get in the supermarket with sugars and maltodextrin and all the rest of it. And then, of course, the massive confounder. Why do they find any evidence against even processed meat? Well, people who are eating burgers and hot dogs, what are they also eating? The buns, the ketchup, the fizzy drinks, and the fries. And you look at the characteristics, they also tend to be the smokers, the non-exercisers, the more likely to be obese, less likely to be educated. They say, well, we adjust for all of that. They don't adjust for the food. They don't adjust for the other foods, the ketchup and the fries and the milkshake. And you can't adjust for a whole lifestyle. You've seen the burger-eating monster outside McDonald's, and you've seen the woman who has macrobiotic food and grass-fed beef who lives in Kensington and Chelsea and has children called Tarquin and Olivia. They are completely different people, and that's why they find it. So the most recent red meat bashing, who remembers this one? A couple of weeks ago, slice of bacon and you drop dead. Literally, just like that, BBC. Rash of bacon a day ups the cancer risk. That was the study that it came from. I look for the headline in the news. I go straight to the study and see what's going on in the study. I know this chap quite well. I had a bit of a row with him at a conference in Zurich last summer. Uh, he's had his declarations of interest as being a member of the Vegetarian Society and the Vegan Society for many, many decades um, and doesn't think that that's a relevant thing uh, to declare when you're coming out with a study that's bashing uh, red meat. I personally think it's quite relevant. Now, the non-findings in this study, you're starting to see now, the most interesting thing about any paper is the non-findings. And this study was just fabulous because the non-findings were there's nothing to do with bowel cancer and poultry, nothing to do with bowel cancer and fish, nothing to do with bowel cancer and dairy milk. You can now use this study as evidence that dairy is fabulous. Nothing with cheese, nothing in fact with red meat because it touched the line of no significance. And then there was nothing positive which I thought was quite fun as well. Uh, tea and coffee wasn't great, fruit and vegetables weren't great, total fiber wasn't great. So all the things that we're told are actually really good for bowel cancer. This study found that they weren't actually that great for bowel cancer. So the only one that it managed to dam in some way is again that processed meat and you've got the confounders that we can't move away from. So I'm gonna stick with that study and use it to look at the three fundamental problems that we always have with those population studies. First of all, it's association, not causation. And they said that there was a 25% association, if I'm reading, uh, no, sorry, 19%, I'm on an angle here, with 25 grams of processed meat a day versus having none. That's your rasher of bacon. That's your 25 grams versus none, 19% difference. Well, Bradford Hill, 1965, when he set out how might you get from association to causation, said if that first number isn't even double, don't bother looking for the other eight criteria. Double would be 100%, not 19%. The second problem we have with epidemiology is that they always scream the relative risk, never the absolute risk. So they're screaming at you 19% risk difference. You think, oh my goodness, if there's 100 people who are eating bacon, then 119 in the other corner are, are all going to drop dead. It is so nothing like that, it's not true, because this is the absolute risk. So they then looked at the people in the study who consumed 21 grams a day of processed meat, which I thought was quite interesting. So they're still having one rasher of bacon a day, they're not having none. These guys are having three a day. The absolute risk difference was eight people in approximately six years, which is an incident rate of about one per 10,000 people in a year. Even if it were causal, and it isn't, it might make a difference. Three rashes of bacon a day versus one might make a difference of one in 10,000. I think you've got something like a one in 3,000 chance of choking on your food and dying at some point in your lifetime. Uh, way more risky than having a slice of bacon. And then, of course, as you've said, we've got the unhealthy person confounder that they're more likely to be all the unhealthy things. And that's what you really observed. It wasn't anything to do with the bacon after all. So what should we eat? I'm probably doing OK, I think. We're getting, getting closer. Um, the Diet Fixed Principles, this was the most recent um, book that I wrote, uh, number one. And this is where I think we can get a lot of harmony. Um, Deborah talked earlier about let's be in a broad church and let's not chuck people out if they're different. This is where the vegans and the carnivores, and there are carnivores nowadays, um, this is where we meet, surely, that we should all agree that we should be eating real food. Number one principle. Number two, choose that real food for the nutrients that it provides. 
And number three, eat a maximum of three times a day. Now, this might resonate with this audience. I often say in conferences, unless you are a cow or want to be the size of one, please stop <laughs> grazing. We have got to stop eating every minute of the day. That's why we're fat and sick. They get fat and healthy. That's what we want them to do. Um, and then just to add the other two, you can ask me about these in the break. If you want to know how alcohol makes you fat and it's got nothing to do with calories or even carbohydrates, I'll let you know. And then we need to do what we're designed to do, which you guys do, tend the land, walk, talk, sing, dance. We don't have to go in the gym and do all that unnatural stuff. But those five principles will stand you in good stead. So eat real food. That doesn't come out of a packet. It comes from a farm, not a factory. Choose that real food for the nutrients that it, that it um, provides. And we're back to this side of the chart because that's where we find the essential fats and the complete proteins, and that's the animal food side of the chart. You won't be able to see this one at the back, but if you get one of those postcards, this is the back of the saturated fat postcard. This is a chart that is looking at a number of key vitamins and minerals, and you've got a number of representative foods there that I just happen to know are very interesting. You've got liver, you've got steak, you've got oily fish, sardines, broccoli, apple, and then I've put in these. So you've got the apple because we're told to eat five a day, We've got the brown rice because we're told to eat healthy whole grains. And we've got lentils because they're known as the rock stars of the nutritional world. They're the rock stars of the plant nutritional world. They're not the rock stars of the real nutritional world because the rock star of the nutritional world is liver. If you ever want to win a nutrition competition, just pick liver. And liver will just clean up on everything that you need from liver. And that's all per 100 grams. You can see in red, if you can see the screen OK, in each row you've got the winner in red. So you can just see at a glance that liver is cleaning up on virtually everything other than the bone nutrients, which is where the oily fish wins. Apple just wins on absolutely naff all. Uh, brown rice. <laughs> brown rice wins on calories, probably not the one you want to be winning on. Um, I have to show you this. I love this. Uh, did you know liver has four times the vitamin C of an apple? That just goes to show you don't need your carbohydrates. So now we move to minerals. Now this is where you would start to expect the foods that come from the ground to start doing well because minerals come from the ground. Um, and brown rice does okay and lentils start picking up a couple of things. Um, and I thought I'm not having that. I'm not having these nutritional rock stars. I'm gonna have a new plant-based nutritional rock star and for everyone in the room who loves chocolate, it's called cocoa powder. <laughs> And cocoa powder cleans up then. You just see it's just gone red for cocoa powder, apart from sardines. And cocoa powder cleans up on zinc and magnesium and copper and all those great things in life. So enjoy your dark chocolate, at least 85%. I have some with me if you're flagging in the break. Um, <laughs> Michael Pollan very famously says, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. I would say eat food, mostly animals, quite a lot. <laughs> because you do, thank you. <laughs> you do actually need to eat quite a lot um, to get your nutrients. Um, I often also joke, nutrients don't grow on trees. Um, quite literally, they, they tend to be found in animals. You need to eat quite a lot of steak to get your zinc requirement on a daily basis. Um, and that then, of course, on the Michael Pollan side, and he's with me. I'm only just taking the piss a little bit here because Michael Pollan is a real foodie, so he's in our church. Um, but that drives you much more down the whole grains, pulses route. This drives you much more down the pasture-fed meat, eggs, dairy, fish and berries, um, and the kind of stuff that you know all about. And we agree on vegetables and salads. Vegetables and salads are good. They're generally good things as you might see up here. So what's really going on? We're really close to the end here now. We can have a bit of scandal. <laughs> Those organizations, that Eat Badly plate, Eat Well, the one I mentioned earlier on. OK, so those well-known logos at the back, Mars, Kellogg's, PepsiCo, Nestle, da, 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 all those lovely companies. Unilever, that's with the, um, the unsaturated fats. Um, those are the organizations. There are only nine representatives asked by Public Health England to put together that Eat Well guide for March 2016. And five of the members, so they can already dominate 
the um, proceedings were representatives from the Institute of Grocery Distribution, British Nutrition Foundation, British Retail Consortium, Food and Drink Federation, Association of Convenience Stores, who just at the time they were working on the Eat Badly plate, were trying to stop any legislation controlling cigarette sales in convenience stores, because of course their job is to look after convenience stores. It's not to look after the health of the nation. So what were they doing designing the health of the nation plate? And all those logos that you see are the British Nutrition Foundation, just some of their many members, but they are all the who's who of the fake food industry. And they were appointed by Public Health England to put together our healthy eating plate. The Eat Lancet Guide that came out recently, within two hours of that being published, I had an open blog up showing the nutritional deficiencies of that Eat Lancet Guide. And very much like the Eat Badly plate, because it was so catastrophically low in animal foods and dietary fat, it was by definition deficient in retinol, your fat soluble vitamins, D3, calcium, zinc, B12, I think just about touched B12. It was even deficient in potassium and sodium, which is actually quite good going because they're in everything. Um, it was quite staggering. And people were pointing out things like you had more calories and grams assigned to sucrose, pure sugar and sweeteners, than you did to meat or fish or eggs or dairy products. Just absolutely insane. So those are the organizations who are effectively behind the Eat Lancet diet. I haven't even ringed all of them. I've just ringed the agri-food biotech companies that you're probably familiar with, like Cargill, um, and you'll know them better than I would, Burla. Uh, and then you've got the, just the classic food companies, Kellogg's, Unilever, again, protect the unsaturated fats, PepsiCo. I should have done it the other way around, actually, and say, just, let's just circle the ones that aren't involved in food and therefore conflicted in some way. And I think you end up with Google, and there's Deloitte's as a consultancy company, and there's probably another consultancy company. But that's what's happening at the moment, and it's a two-pronged strategy. So you attack real food. It's happening in the paper again today. I'm getting emails saying there's something on red meat and breast cancer and eulogize plant foods. So attack, attack the real stuff. There's no margin in this anyway. Come on, what's the problem? Like, why are you complaining? Loads and loads and loads of money in fake meat, fake food, cereals that you can put in a packet and add loads of sugar to, not the nice stuff that Nick produces, but the cheap crap that Kellogg's produce. And that's your twin prong strategy. And that's the recipe for feeding the world. And it's nutritionally deficient, but it will make a few people very, very rich. And I don't think that's very nice. Um, our way forward, um, you can also call this the vegetarian myth because what we're up against at the moment is the idea that the plant-based diet is so much better for us and there's a moral argument saying we shouldn't kill anything and the counter to that is to ask the, particularly the vegan because the vegetarian is, is smart to eat the dairy and the eggs, what do you think you eat? Not just what do you eat, but what do you think you eat for which nothing has died? Because there is almost certainly no such thing. Great reference on slide 39, plant deaths in agriculture, the animals that are killed, plowing the wheat and the soy, which is then fed to the vegans. There is nothing we can eat for which something hasn't died. It's just a question of where you draw the line. It's a, a circle, and you have to draw your line somewhere. The political argument, we can only feed the world if everyone is vegetarian. Well, we can only feed the world if we've got topsoil. And as we've been hearing today, we don't have topsoil without ruminants. And unless you guys are going to start keeping them as pets, they need to be part of the food chain. So the millennials who are going vegan at a rate of knots need to realize that while they're shouting about climate change, they're doing the wrong thing. Their hearts are in the right place, but they're doing the wrong thing. We need to help them understand that. And the nutritional argument, it's healthy. That's the one. Don't even start vegans because you're just not going to win that. that that's your best one. I, I was veggie for 20 years. I still don't like the idea of eating animals. I can understand that one. The nutritional one, forget it. You pick any food, I'm going to pick liver. I'm going to win. The only question is, how much do you want to wager? Because I could, I could make loads of money doing that. And of course, all of those, the plant-based diets, the companies behind those plant-based diets are trying to make us fat and sick and then they get fat cat rich at the same time, which is just great. This is the final slide. There aren't surgeries in the jungles. There aren't surgeries in the field. Your animals are not going to vets because animals, by and large, are not sick. It's the domain of humans to be chronically sick. We are the only chronically sick animal on the planet. And may I put it to you guys that perhaps that's because we're the only species clever enough to make our own food 
and stupid enough to eat it. Thank you very much for listening. I've got a feeling we're not going to have any time for questions. Um, so, Will, can we move straight on to you? And, and please stick to less than 10 minutes. We will be giving you the, a five minute and then a two minute warning. Okay. Is that because I was naughty last time? Yeah. <laughs> we don't tell you. Oh, okay. Uh, I will, uh, I did breeze through those slides on raw milk pretty fast. Uh, the first third of them anyway. Uh, but I will make them available to anybody that wants to contact me, and uh, I, I think Wilma has my contact info. Thank you. I'm a free-range animal, so moving around is important. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, I'm a holistic veterinarian, uh, trained uh, first degree in animal nutrition, and then I went to vet school. And uh, I spent the last 40 years on doing everything I learned uh, in the centers of higher education. These are Jersey cattle that my grandfather had. I'm named after my two grandfathers, William Winter and George Twyman. William means defender, uh, George means farmer. So I, somewhere along the way, I got my destiny uh, through my name, because that's what I do for a living. This is a camel. I just had to put it in there because I've milked a camel. <laughs> This is my uh, 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 former business, the Uptown Locavore. It's a raw milk store uh, and, and uh, stuff uh, I, I have that's all farm fresh. They, uh, all the members is private. You have to sign a membership form that says you won't sue us. There's a class, cra classroom lecture and then all sorts of uh, nutrient-dense foods. Well, then this happened. Uh, this was uh, 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 almost, uh, well, it was last May, so it was about a year ago. Uh, this is the third time I've been arrested and shut down, for mostly for selling raw milk, but uh, operating kind of without a license. These are the food police coming in, uh, confiscating all my food. Uh, all the freezers and uh, refrigerators were uh, sealed with a felony offense if they were broken. This is me meeting with the lawyers of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. They were extremely helpful. They're a branch of the Weston A. Price Foundation. And I'm still uh, doing a lot with raw milk. I did become an uh, inspector and a certifier for the American Grass-Fed Association. I like your organization better, which uses the word pasture instead of grass, but we, uh, we work a lot with uh, uh, the problem that we have a lot of imported meat, and we have nothing against that, but we really want to promote our, our, our situation for American farmers. So uh, I had to do this at the World Dairy Expo, which is a disastrous organization that I made the mistake of going to. I was stuck there for 10 days. Uh, grass never tasted so good. I love t-shirts. Uh, so there's four things. If you want to do grass dairy, it uh, boils down to four concepts. And I'm going to give them to you. The first one is uh, the genetics of the animal, which is changing the paradigm. And uh, granted, that's a beef animal there, but uh, there's an example of a low-line Angus on the right and a Hereford on the left. Uh, and we're doing that with dairy cattle, too. The average lifespan of a dairy animal in America is 43 months. That's 1.3 lactations. We call it turn them and burn them. Uh, and uh, I was at a dairy uh, just yesterday where we saw an 18-year-old cow. She had a baby calf by her side, and she was banging out a calf for every year and delicious milk. So that's, what, that's the difference. Uh, the three biggest killers of dairy cows are acidosis, which comes from grain. Uh, it makes D-lactic acid. Mold mycotoxin from moldy forages. And the third thing is called funny protein. And that's grass. It has low energy and therefore high ammonia. And it causes the BUN that you hear about and uh, MUN. Uh, this is the extreme to which we've gone in uh, dairy physiology. Uh, I, I show pictures of what Angus used to look like. They were like a block of meat. Again, it's, a, it's not a dairy slide. But what I, I put these in here, just so you can get your eye wrapped around what an ideal dairy animal looks like. They're not a skeleton, a, a rack of bones with skin draped over it. Uh, they have a beautiful deep heart girth, deep body, a very gentle face, a very compassionate face. Um, this is a biodynamic dairy. You can see all biodynamic cattle have horns, and the horns are treated with a copper. That's why they're green. 
Uh, the biodynamic movement believes that they pulled down cosmic energy from the stars and the moon and the atmosphere. And the horn is actually an antenna, just like a radio antenna. Uh, this is another old cow. And, and I just put some pictures. There's so much beauty in these grass farms, just like where we are today. Uh, I've seen nothing but gorgeous cattle uh, this whole trip, by the way. And there's a little irony in me coming from America where we've uh, pretty much destroyed the archetype of the cow, and I'm back here where so many of our cattle came from, and it's a beautiful thing for me. But again, just to see uh, what we've been hearing about, about ethics of animals that are happy and having a good time in the grass. This is 100% grass-fed uh, uh, Maple Hill Organic uh, Consortium in New York. They have a waiting list of 200 dairies that want to sell 100% certified grass milk. There are, there's one type of milk in America that's dying, and it's called organic milk. Uh, organic Valley, the largest uh, aggregator, has lost $200 million in 2018. Uh, organic milk is glutted, for one thing. And the other thing, the panache is worn off of the government-controlled organic milk. Now, I'm not against organic at all. That's what I want to eat. But there's no guarantee of nutrient density. But this 100% grass-fed is hot, hot, hot. There's two things that are hot in dairy in America. One is grass milk, and the other is A2A2, and that's a type of beta casein that we were talking about earlier. This is Steve Campbell doing linear measurement. We can make an algorithm by, the, by about 12 measurements on an animal, and we can predict their protein. I just uh, like to say I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to go really fast. I'm going to leave out all the adjectives and the adverbs and adjectives. Oh, I said that twice, didn't I? So I've wasted uh, 30 seconds here. I'm going to even leave out the punctuation the, West say, the rest of the way. So me like grass. This shows the different rumen quality of baby calves that were killed after, let's say, four to 12 weeks, uh, showing that the thing that makes a baby calf have a rumen that looks like shag carpeting with all the villi is butter fat. When you put them on soybean juice or artificial replacement, they, they don't get it. So that's one. Number two is what's called Hybrix Nutrition. Now, I haven't tested this grass out here, but I will this afternoon to see how much sugar it has in it. But Brix is an index of nutritional density of the grass. A lot of grass looks green. Yard grass looks green. But if, if cattle try to eat it, it may be like a nothing burger. There's just no nutrition in it. And the energy is the number one limiting factor. And sugar is what a plant, you know, we just heard the bad things, didn't we, about sugar. But sugar in a plant actually becomes the building block for all the polyphenolic uh, secondary metabolites that plants make. You've heard of resveratrol, lycopene, lutein, uh, tannins, pectins, alkaloids. Those are medicines that plants make, not for us. They don't really care that much about us, but it's so they don't get aphids and leaf hoppers and uh, viruses and, and blight. Uh, when the, our cattle eat those nutrients, they stay healthy as plant medicine. When we eat the milk or the meat or the eggs, we get the, or that's just passed on to us. Uh, this is a really good book, Grass, the Forgiveness of Nature. And, and this is, again, I'm not putting organic down whatsoever, but 100% grass milk beats out organic grain-fed milk in about uh, 12 different ways, and we've measured that. This is just on conjugated linoleic acid. It's much higher in this, uh, probably they found that the most healthiest nutrient, maybe you would agree, Zoe, maybe of, of all the micronutrients, wouldn't you say CLA maybe is the most, I mean, they are, they're all uh, essential, but it's really uh, a powerful thing. These studies that you can't read are some of the stuff coming out of higher centers of education. This one is about uh, feeding uh, restaurant grease, recycled restaurant grease to dairy cows. And they actually did, a, they got funded to do this study. This was on feeding chicken manure to dairy cows as their diet. And then the, the, you're going to uh, drink that milk. Uh, you don't have the, the, one of the big problems we have, which is genetically modified corn and soybeans. Uh, but this slide shows just how much glyphosate, which is one of the nastiest uh, ho holocaustic catastrophes that's ever hit uh, our, our population. Uh, and again, I'll give these uh, technical slides to anybody that wants to uh, contact me. I'll give those to you. So uh, we say grass is the forgiveness of nature. Uh, here's a book by a, a guy named Voisson from France. Probably mispronounced that. Who would, who would write a book titled Soil, Grass, and Cancer? Isn't that an amazing uh, 
uh, amalgam of words. It's really true. Here's a book written uh, that was like around the year 1500 in Germany. It's called Death and the Plowman. And that is the devil beating those mules or horses, and he's plowing up our fertility. So even uh, 500 years ago, they knew this. Uh, Nick Bernard and myself met at the Weston A. Price Foundation based on the work of a holistic dentist who traveled all the seven continents back in the 30s when you ate pretty much what you grew or what grew around you. And, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, <laughs> I will send you these slides. There are two more aspects. One is rotational grazing that you've heard about this morning uh, from Texas. Everybody here can learn to do that. It's amazing. I've flown over the half of this country. I've never, I've maybe seen one operation out of thousands that's doing the rotational grazing. And the fourth one is what I do for a living, which is natural medicine. I use no antibiotics, no vaccines, and no wormers. And we have radiantly healthy, beautiful cattle. And I will send you the other 215 slides. <laughs> Right, two of us have just made an executive decision. We're going to skip the coffee break. If anybody really is desperate for coffee, you can go out and come back in again. Um, and there will be coffee at five. But in the meantime, we at this farm have been so fortunate to have met Mary Clear because her daughter lives here. Um, and uh, she is one of the most uh, inspirational and uncontrollable and that says something when you think of the speakers we've had today. Um, people that I've ever met. So over to Mary Clear from Incredible Edible. Am I, um, do I sound loud? Can you hear me? I just want to check who's a vegetarian, please, or another one with the V word. Don't be scared to put your hand up. Yes, yeah, so am I. I felt a bit lonely then, but I thought I'm a big girl in a big tent, so I'm just going to go for it. So I've had my say. I was in the red meat section. That freaked me out. But here we go. I'm going to use the clicker. So I'm just going to tell you something that's not got a lot to do with cows. But in the end, it's got everything to do with what's happening on this farm. So this is Todmorden. Have you heard of it? It's in West Yorkshire. It's a tiny town in a very steep valley. Um, a glacial valley. Um, it's a long way from anywhere. Um, very low unemployment, cheap property, but kind of very picturesque and lovely. In 2008, remember what happened? The bankers, aka the wankers, had just been caught out on what they were really doing across the world. And in 2008 was the beginning of the financial crash. A whole group of people came together in our town who said, our generation has had the benefit of university education, a decent NHS. We were connected with the soil, the birds, the bees. When I was a child, I knew my thrush from my blackbird. I knew Speedwell from Forget-Me-Not. We were connected to this planet. In 2008, it, things started to fall away. And we thought, what can we do for our town, not the planet, not the world, for our town? to make it a better kind of place. Because we're really worried. We're worried for the future of our children and our children's children, and the birds, the bees, and the animals. We were worried about what would be left. When the bankers had finally finished, and look what we're left with, even democracy <laughs> is being shook to its roots. We're not left with much. We thought we're going to do something. We're going to create some kind of action. And we thought we'll create a kinder, more confident, more connected community using the power of food and growing. We'll work together, eat together, we'll share knowledge, but most of all, we'll share hope for the future of the planet. And we'll, we'll have no public money, we've got no office, we've got no staff. It's 100% volunteers because every community is crawling alive like the soil should be with skills, with people who can join the dots. So using our local community, we thought we'll do three things in a time of crisis. We'll support business, that's producers and farmers. We'll do things in community, that's everybody. And we'll 
really try to work on the learning and reconnection with the soil from cradle to grave. And our underlying principle is be the change we want to see. Don't talk about Europe. Don't talk about um, politics nationally, globally. Be the change we want to see. Do something ourselves. So this is what we do. It's crazy, but it works for us. And we've been doing it for 11 years. So twice a month, 50 people meet together, complete strangers. We don't know. There's no booking system. We meet together, tiny tots and older people, and we garden the town. Mm -mm, water, but never mind. We grow food. In, this is crazy. We grow food in public places, roundabouts, car parks, hospitals, police station. We grow food in public places to tell people about seasons, about the birds, about the bees, about what do apples look like, not in a plastic bag. So we're doing all that stuff. We've gone on from gardening just so we fix things. A bench is broken. We might as well fix it. We've got loads of tools. We've got loads of people. So that's how we spend our time. You are what you eat. So 50 of us meet, to, meet together. And we all eat together afterwards. And really, I don't think anyone gives two for the gardening. I think our cooks are really ace. So we all eat together. And it's really a fantastic group of people. So we've got um, really posh BBC executives. We've got the local drug recovery. We've got people on the wobbly side of life. It's a really great mix of people. Our underlying principle is we like naughty but nice. And that means we don't write consultation documents. We don't go around asking, groveling for permission. We don't say, what about health and safety? Well, not too much, in case the insurers are listening. So this is our police station in Todmorden. It's south-facing. So we thought, why should the police have a south-facing police station in a dark valley? So we planted it all up with food. Anyway, they like it. This is um, our health center. It is, we've unplanted, uh, I think the word's dug up, all their stuff. <laughs> and we planted all our stuff, which is really lovely. Apples, pears, strawberries, rhubarb. The whole thing is surrounded with food. This is nice. We're self-sufficient. So we don't um, ask for public money. We don't apply for grants. We uh, rely on vegetable tourism. People from all over the world uh, come to walk about and look at a few manky veg in a car park. <laughs> That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Because people want hope. People want to be reconnected. It's crazy, but the simplest things is what we as human crave for in our hearts, is to be reconnected with the land. So here, here, we don't even have a coach park in our town, but the only coaches that come are for people wanting to look at vegetables, which is very strange. <laughs> So um, this is at the station. So, uh, and strangely enough, this idea is spread all over the world. So um, there are projects absolutely all over the world, Africa, Australia, France. It's really huge and really big because nobody wants to own a copyright. No one wants to write a book. No one's making any money. So anybody, everything's open source. So it's not just about veg. This is Mike, a straw man. We made him because there was a street where the shops weren't doing very well. So we thought, oh, we've got loads of willow because we're in a wet, damp valley. We'll uh, make a big man and people will come. And sure enough, people are funny what they like to look at. <laughs> so um, our other absolute belief is it's better to ask forgiveness than it is permission. So <laughs> for, for 160 years, this horse tunnel had no handrail. So we thought, we'll just screw some eyelets in the wall, put some rope on, get a mare to cut a ribbon. Everyone thinks it's legal, so it's a top tip. So we've, we've got a new development called Kindness Boxes. These are right in the middle of town. You can put your food, clothing, uh, electrical goods, and it all operates itself. Anybody can help themselves when they want to. We have another scheme going. A third of all food in the world that is produced is chucked out. We've got a scheme where food um, from supermarkets is brought together in what's called a share house. And people can buy it as pay as you feel. So if they've no money, they take it. And we in Todmorden 
pay a standing order, those who can afford it, to subsidise food for the poor. Because we really believe in feeding bellies, not bins. And we love the idea that we're paying from our food, we pay for our food from a, that would have been in a dustbin to feed others. So that gives me a little thrill. Um, so ethical, kinder. I'm on this farm. I'm a vegetarian. I'm never going to eat a cow. But it's so important what you said about being in a big tent, about collaboration. Collaboration in a, I was going to say a bad word, uh, uh, a trumped up world. We need to collaborate more in a made up world with her. All of it, we need to collaborate more. And when we collaborate more, we are ethical, we are kinder. As humans, we're hardwired for stories. There were storytellers here. Everybody wants a story about where did my food come from? Where did my cow, where did he live his lovely, happy life? We want to know those things. Narrative is everything. So I think, um, I know I've been coming here for a long time. It's, if I was a cow, I'd be happy. <laughs> Until that, you know, we won't talk about it. So if you think I'm bullying because, you know, we're all volunteers, we could just be making it all up and talking really fast because we've because we can. Um, anyway, someone paid someone else tons, shed loads of money to do some research. So it's all there on our website. So um, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>
and they will be age and gender and genetic propensity to a particular condition, and that will override everything else. Okay, thank you. Next question. There's someone in the back in an orange yeah. top. Yeah. And I'd like to know a bit more from Will about how we mitigate uh, disease in cattle. The question was how to mitigate disease in cattle. Yeah. Uh, the four big ones, uh, you don't have a lot of anaplasmosis here, but it's brucellosis, TB, and yonis in dairy cattle, right? Uh, we found that if you go to the cause behind the cause behind the cause, it's almost exclusively nutritional. So we fix that first. My mentor in life was Juliet de Berkeley Levy, the grandmother herbalist. I read her book, the uh, the guide, the herbal guide to farm and stable, and I became unemployable in a veterinary hospital. Uh, and her her solutions, and I highly recommend that book. It's 50 years old, but it's as accurate today as it ever was about the herbal lay. Re, have you you've read it? You're nodding your head. Uh, they eradicated TB and brucellosis in, in cattle by using a mineral cocktail. Ira Ellison, uh, Allison, the uh, miracle of the Ozarks, he was called, used it at Randallay Farms, which became Carnation Dairy, uh, used a mineral cocktail, and they, what, the word they used, I love, they fed TB out of their herd. They fed brucellosis out of their herd. So I take everything back to that, and the rest is downhill all the way. Okay, thank you. Next, really quick question. Who's got a quick question? Guy in the pink shirt there. Thank you. I'd like a question to Will again. I mean, you don't use vaccines in your animals. Could you uh, no vaccine. Now, here's something very Why? important. I put plan B in place, the nutritional correction, before we strip away the crutches. If you're giving your animals vaccines, antibiotics, or wormers, those are drugs, and I call that an animal that's a drug addict. Because a drug addict, I think, is, an, is anything that can't live without their drugs, right? You take away their drugs, they could die. Uh, so I don't want a herd full of drug addicts. But I don't want to kill everything either. If, if, I wouldn't have a job if I pulled away the crutches and didn't give them the true health first. So we put that in place. We slowly eliminate the vaccines one by one, getting rid of the foo-foo dust first, and then going on down to tetanus and black leg, the more, uh, what people might say, the more critical vaccines, and we're, we're gold. But those animals are not in jeopardy. That logic then follows, the same applies to humans. I'm sorry, what? The logic follows, the same applies to humans. I think, did you hear, did you understand? Say it in English. The same way. <laughs> the same logic applies to humans. Same logic oh, yeah, this, absolutely. The uh, Hippocrates, the, the father of modern medicine, said uh, all, all, all food is medicine, and that is the medicine that we need. So absolutely, same thing. We're all addicted to drugs. Not a lot of us. <laughs> OK, I was, I was going to finish on that point, but maybe not. So is there, is there one final question, perhaps, around the, the theme of hope that Mary uh, brought to life so compellingly? People want hope. Yeah. Give us some hope. Yeah, is it a hopeful question? It's not a question. OK, well, it has to be quick, because we're okay. moving on. Sorry, I was, I've been thinking over lunch that maybe I really wanted to say that before lunch. I wanted to react to someone who said that um, something like uh, clearly the system of the ethical dairy will never be applied in large scale. And I just wanted to challenge that. I just wanted to say that actually what is marginal can become mainstream. And I just want to give one example which is unrelated to farming, but just for you all to think about it. Um, if we take the example of slavery, and uh, a long time ago slavery was mainstream, and today it's marginal. We moved from mainstream to marginal, yeah? And I think we can apply that in many, many, many aspects, and especially farming. <laughs> Fantastic note to end on. Thank you very much.